All right. Uh, so we're almost at the end of the workshop. Um, and so the goal of this uh, final panel is to synthesize what we've learned uh, over the last uh, two days. Um, so we have three distinguished panelists uh, who will engage in a discussion and explore next steps to enhance the incorporation of climate into macroeconomic modeling. Um, I, we're going to start with some uh, prepared uh, uh, Um, and then we will open it up uh, later. And as usual, uh, please use the uh, online um, uh, raise hand function to raise your hands. Um, so we're going to start um, with Emmy. Uh, so can we get, uh, do, you have, do you have slides, Emmy? Yeah. Oh, OK, great. Uh, so I think people most largely introduced, been introduced, but Emmy Nakamura is the Chancellor's Professor of Economics at Berkeley. Um, and her research focuses on monetary and fiscal policy, business cycles, and macroeconomic measurement. Thank you. Um, well, it's been a, a great conference. Uh, I learned a lot. I wanted to go back uh, for a moment to the first session just to sort of remind us all where we've been and, and where we're going. Um, we've been thinking about macro policy models, um, the ones that are used by the government, for example, uh, the CBO model or uh, the mouse model and other related sort of simple macro policy models. Um, these models, their primary use case are things like forecasting growth, uh, deficits, fiscal policy scenarios, things like this. Um, they are a very parsimonious representation of the economy. Um, the first order thing that's included is accounting identities of various kinds. Um, other parts of the model, you know, there, there are a lot of aspects which are, you know, simple statistical relationships, um, but as has been emphasized, um, many of these chan channels are, are very simple uh, in nature. So to a large extent, these models take climate change science as inputs, as opposed to saying something substantive uh, about, you know, what uh, climate change will do um, and um, what, you know, the, 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 the framers of these models are, are asking for to some extent is, is how to best uh, adapt their models uh, to use them as an approximation for how um, climate change should inform their policy projections for these, um, for these use cases, such as forecasting deficits and things like that. One thing that I wanted to emphasize um, is that it's not just the models that matter in terms of the discussion that we just had. There was a lot of emphasis on the notion of having new models and you know, that's certainly a relevant thing to do. But I also wanted to emphasize that the parameters really matter. So um, with these simple models, um, the, the outputs are really only as good as the inputs. And depending on how uh, you choose the parameters, you can really kind of get anything under the sun. So um, I think that's important to recognize that it's, um, one thing to hope for having, um, you know, all the channels there. Um, it's another thing to, to, to actually have the right parameters for all these channels. And it is a real challenge, even taking climate out of the picture, um, to know um, how various, uh, you know, changes in the economy will, will affect outcomes. Um, you know, macroeconomic forecasting is really difficult in this regard. And I think the fundamental reason is that uh, macroeconomics is really a, a a strong case of small data in the sense that we only have a very small number of recessions and recoveries and disinflationary episodes to learn from. So we're often in a situation of trying to draw analogies between things that are not very, really very similar. So like in US history, you know, recent US history, we've only really had one major disinflationary episode. We can look at other countries, but naturally there are big differences versus these other countries. So it's a situation where, um, where it's often a challenge, um, even if you think a channel exists to know how big it is, and that's even before you get to the climate. So, so I think that's kind of important to be realistic about that. We can think of adding many different channels, but in the history of macroeconomic forecasting, it's well understood that more complicated models often forecast much worse. And I think that's one of the uh, tensions here um, that, that we're kind of up against. Um, so, 
I think that um, against this backdrop of, of, of the challenges of, of macroeconomic forecasting, even before you get to the climate, I want to emphasize some important caveats that have come up, um, you know, important things that are kind of missing from the macroeconomic models, um, or, you know, maybe not maybe missing partly in emphasis. Um, so to some extent, economists know some of these limitations, but perhaps we don't always emphasize them as much as we should. So one is the distinction between GDP and welfare. That's clearly an important issue. A second thing is aggregate versus sectoral or regional outcomes. That's come up a number of times. Um, there's the role of trade and, and why that means that, you know, things that happen to the rest of the world could also affect the United States. There's the short versus the long-term. Um, and in fact, what even the words short and long-term mean uh, which I think are actually quite different in the context of, of, of this macro forecasting world where long term often means more than 10 years, um, which, you know, is very different, I think, than how the world word is used in the climate literature. There's, um, you know, two way feedback versus only a one way causal chain for the climate effect. So in these super simple models, there's there's no two way feedback, um, which is clearly a simplification. Um, but you could, you, you know, the, the simplest way of introducing climate into these models is to have a, a one-way causal chain from, from some climate effect that's viewed as exogenous into the model. And then there's, of course, the role of, of uncertainty, that many of the things we think about with regard to, to climate um, are, are, you know, uh, bad case scenarios that we want to focus on, even if they don't affect the mean very much. And that's um, that's not the way that these macro forecasts are currently done. They tend to focus on some kind of baseline case, and that may be very problematic for this particular application. Um, just to bring us back to sort of, um, you know, what, what is the uh, sort of simple use case that one might imagine um, with these simple models, uh, the Troika models, um, you know, think of them as a one sector model with a, you know, one, I think the simple case would be a one way causal chain from climate into macro outcomes where um, climate enters through productivity. Um, so I think one question would be, suppose you're going to use that model as an approximation, clearly it's an approximation in all kinds of ways. Um, what would be the best, you know, parameters to use? Is there sort of like a gold standard um, that we can take from the climate science literature uh, for, for, for what parameters you should use and, um, and, and for what parameters at, at what horizons um, and what sort of cases. So presumably given that, you know, risk and uncertainty is gonna play a big role, um, are there particular horizons that uh, macro modelers should be focusing on when they're contemplating these effects? Um, and are there particular time horizons that they should be focusing on um, in thinking about this? You know, these I think are some practical questions that um, might be asked by people trying to do this. Um, you know, could, could there be several, you know, realistic scenarios that, that should be um, considered? And finally, um, is productivity the primary channel through, one would, through which one would want to think about these effects? Because there are several different channels one could think about, even in this simplest of, of, of models. Um, productivity, productivity is one of them. So, so these are some of the questions that sort of struck me as, you know, we, we made some progress on and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, this, this round table will continue to be a forum for us uh, thinking about uh, communicating on these, on these fronts. So our next uh, respondent um, is James Rising. James is an assistant professor at the University of Delaware in the School of Marine Sciences and Policy who works on the impacts of climate change in a variety of forms, bringing together empirical estimates and integrated assessment models, uh, models of socio-environmental systems, focusing on complex systems, food, fisheries, and resource management. James? Thanks so much. Really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think that uh, one of the reasons I was invited was because I helped organize a, uh, a workshop not too dissimilar from this um, with the Royal Society in London, uh, three months ago, um, that was called the New Horizons for Increasing the Understanding of Economic Consequences of Climate Change. So it's very much focused on uh, the damages side of this, but um, um, there's an awful lot of overlap between the discussions that are happening here and uh, what we discussed there. Um, so I'm going to be bringing in a bit of that. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, one of the things that I think about a lot is, is what's the research agenda here moving forward? Um, and I think that the research agenda necessary for incorporating these climate um, feedbacks into macroeconomic models uh, 
really needs to include our better understanding of both transition costs and damages. Um, so I want to sort of open open that up and, and say there there's still first order questions that we have about the scale of transition costs. Most of the evidence that we have of, um, of what the scale of the costs that we're looking at are coming from optimized en energy system models um, or engineering estimates. There are massive amounts of uh, emission reductions that are available in these models at negative or zero cost. Um, but as economists, we, we think that there probably isn't a free lunch and that if we um, want to take advantage of those emission reductions, we're probably going to have to nudge or push or incentivize people to do it. And, and figuring out um, what those inputs are is, is, a, is, like I said, a first order question. On the damages side, just thinking about um, the, uh, the GDP damages, like you saw from Marshall Burke, um, there's a there's there's a very robust literature that's emerged from um, some of the work that the Marshalls contributed to. Francis Moore had five different models uh, that were incorporated into the um, the OMB model. Uh, these all have different assumptions on how temperature and precipitation are included. Different assumptions about um, the persistence of damages, about differential vulnerability, about the role of adaptation, um, and so. Uh, these decisions actually have order of magnitude differences. We don't know on an order of magnitude what the damages that we should be putting into the macro models are. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't know even which are the most important channels when you think of a bottom-up perspective that will affect the macro economy. If you look at a, a review of, um, the, of different literature, uh, some studies say that agriculture is the most important. Some say that, that uh, health is the most important. There are, there are many different things that come up as just the most important one, um, much less uh, knowing where the rest uh, all lie in there. Um, so uh, we, we have this, um, just to, to give a sense, it's being informed by the, the Royal Society event, of the scale of the challenge for understanding some of these damages, we're talking about a, a globally correlated um, disruption with potentially uh, large-scale spillovers, large-scale um, discontinuities in the structure of the economic system, where both local uh, impacts feeding up international impacts and global impacts feeding down international impacts are going to play a really important role. Um, I think that uh, so we, we, after um, the the panel uh, that proposed that um, the general scale of these would be on the order of one to one point three percent, that's that's sort of been um, a point of knowledge here. Uh, I think I think that we should expect that that's a, con a significant underestimate. Um, Based on uh, work I've done in the UK, uh, the moment that you include spillovers and the potential for uh, large-scale disruptions, um, you end up more, look at more like, well, in the UK, it, it came out to 5.5%. I would expect the US to be uh, um, at risk of higher percentage losses in 2050 than that. And, and inequality, um, heterogeneity, and, and um, temporal uh, variability all matter. Um, so we we don't have the transition cost inputs to the level that we need. We don't have the damage estimate inputs to the level that we need. These are research um, dimensions. And I would say that we don't have models adequate to the task of uh, properly capturing the feedback uh, loops that we need to, to understand how these damages and transition costs will interact. Um, we don't have models that properly capture uh, non-stationarity and disruptions. We uh, don't have a good connection between investment under uncertainty, which is a, a core question within all the climate economic literature, um, including um, ambiguity and, and model specification, which Lars mentioned, um, or uh, the role, again, of heterogeneity and variability, um, which are going to have 
significant macroeconomic consequences. Um, so what do we do knowing that, uh, that these are all things that, uh, that we expect to see in the future as, as we continue to, um, to work on this research? Uh, I think that there's, um, there's one point of light, which is that this workshop is actually part of a, uh, a global effort to update these models. I know that the World Bank is figuring out how to incorporate climate into its model, in particular, looking at structural changes. I know that the IMF is looking at how to incorporate climate into its models, looking at environmental capital and sustainability. Um, uh, the uh, integrated assessment models of, um, of PIC and, and other energy system models are now trying to incorporate damages so they can have both sides of this equation. There's, there's an incredible amount of really exciting work going on right now that uh, um, I think uh, this workshop um, should see itself as, as being part of. Um, last, uh, let, me, let me make two more quick comments and then I'll, I'll finish. Um, uh, the first, uh, another um, point from the Royal Society event uh, is that um, GDP is likely inadequate even for, even as a metric for the macroeconomic um, uh, discussions that that these these models need to inform. Um, certainly, it's a it's a poor and complete metric, but that's not that's not actually my focus. The um, uh, it, GDP is we know is a is a flow based on various underlying stocks, including natural stocks, um, including uh, wealth stocks, and thinking about the inclusive wealth natural stock uh, features that result in. GDP, um, I think, is is going to be uh, a feature of some of these future models, um, and also uh, we tend to think within the macro context that mainly we just have to worry about the ma the market scale, the market impacts of climate damages, but at the scale that the non-market impacts are likely to have, the scale that um, increased mortality risk is expected to have, or um, or, or labor disutility is expected to have, those are going to have significant market consequences. There's going to be a, a, a strong channel between non-market impacts and market impacts into things like GDP and tax receipts. Um, uh, the work from, from Climate Impact Lab on uh, adaptation costs and mortality um, shows this. Uh, there's some interesting work I saw recently on the mental health consequences of climate change, where 45% of young people uh, say that they are um, uh, impaired because of the mental health consequences of, of climate change. I don't know quite how to how to incorporate that kind of information, but I think that that we need to engage with it. Um, just a um, quick uh, list of um, the uh, the top line takeaways from the, the Royal Society meeting, which I think um, I've mostly already mentioned, uh, first was um, interdisciplinarity in these conversations things is incredibly important. Actually, it, it ended up being quite um, contentious in our meeting. Uh, There's a lot more shouting at each other there than, than there was here, um, but we still thought it was a good idea. Um, figure out adaptation uh, in, in, and in particular um, on, on the mitigation side, also learning um, and the role of uh, of changing development and so, uh, at the um, industry and sector level um, was important. Ethics, including inequality and on the mitigation side, justice matters. Um, that the future is not gonna look the same as the past um, is, was, was sort of a, a core message from that meeting. Um, that extreme events and tipping points uh, are an important feature of where we need to be looking at for research and that um, Migration, displacement, and climate-induced uh, conflict are, are sort of going to be um, shaping damages in the future. Uh, are all things that we, we need to grapple with, and uh, and and really are just starting to. Thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, our final panelist is Chris uh, Bavares, who is a co-head of U.S. Economics at IH Market, uh, which is part of S&P Global. Um, and has nearly 40 years of experience in macro modeling, forecasting, and policy analysis, has 
co-head of U.S. economics at IHS Market, and his previous role as principal of macroeconomic advisors, uh, which we learned is a, a key uh, model within the Troika framework, and a member of the staff at CEA in 1981-1982. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it, I'm honored to be here. I feel like uh, one of the kids who finally was invited to sit at the adults' table at Thanksgiving. Um, Anyway, kudos to the folks who conceived uh, the need for this meeting, and uh, I think uh, hopefully you'll continue to promote the cross-pollination and sharing of information. I think it's been incredibly insightful and uh, stimulating. And this leads me to my first takeaway um, that I, you know, this is really stating the obvious, but sometimes it's worthwhile to state the obvious. Um, it, it takes a village uh, in this complex subject that we're uh, studying, and it's going to take a village of analysts and models uh, to do a good job uh, at, at this task. So we're modeling complex systems where our understanding remains limited. These models are laced with layers of uncertainty, as, as was uh, uh, pointed out in the very first session. And we should be careful to guard against the natural tendency to believe that just because we can print out numbers to as many decimals as uh, we, we care to, that, that in any way we can actually project with much accuracy. Um, we do have to make these projections, but we need to be humble about our ability to, to be accurate. As someone who's made a lot of bad forecast, no, good forecasts have turned out to be wrong. Um, I, you know, um, I, we've learned to be humble. Um, the interactions between the natural systems and economic systems will continue to intensify on a business as usual basis. So the non-stationarity is a complexity that we face. Um, and this suggests to me that a portfolio of models that each of which is optimized to describe a given system and it is uh, cared, built for, care, cared by, and run by subject matter experts who are intimately familiar with its functioning and its shortcomings really needs to be necessary uh, to, as part of this process. And then there needs to be an integration of the results of these models. So sorry, we're not going to build the grand unifying theory of climate change and macroeconomics is not going to happen in, in my lifetime. So, but I think we can uh, each uh, ask what it is we need from the other and hopefully get the inputs that are needed to build systems that are not perfect, but are useful. Uh, and I believe this really was the message also from the excellent CEA white and OMB white paper that came out uh, in March. It was really very well done. That's the first takeaway. Second takeaway, Jim Stock mentioned uh, the deep uncertainties associated with this whole topic. Uh, we didn't really address those deep uncertainties head on much, but as each speaker came up and presented really insightful material at the, in the back part of my brain just kept spinning about, you know, what are these deep uncertainties? So I have my own list and you probably have yours. So, and, and so this is by no means complete, but it's just some that, that, that come up. So deep uncertainty number one. Will the cost of fossil fuels rise or fall over time as we approach net zero? You each are formulating an answer in your own head. And I bet <laughs> that one's, there's not a consensus on this. True, demand for these fuels will fall, but some argue that investments will decline faster so that oil prices won't fall. But you know, it seems to me, my simple intuition is that they need to go to the lowest lift cost over time uh, and or to the nearest alternative, natural gas. So we think fossil fuel price, you know, I'm on the prices will decline, but not everybody agrees. Second question, will the equilibrium real risk-free interest rate rise or fall? And by how much? <laughs> we just don't know. Okay, increase in uncertainty and risk premia associated with the transition policies suggests that we'll have higher risky rates and that will put downward pressure on risk-free rates. Large investments in energy transitions driven in part by subsidies and public infrastructure investments aimed at climate hardening and remediation, higher pace of depreciation of the capital stock due to damage from climate means that gross investment has to be higher to follow the path of desired capital stocks. Uh, and this is coming at the same time that we're dealing with the increased investments for chips and, and IJA, as some call it. So there's be lots of in upward pressure on interest rates from this increase in investment. Okay, now this upward pressure on rates is gonna be reinforced by the decline in government saving if subsidies are debt financed, which because based on the elevated take-up rates, a good part of these subsidies in the IRA will be debt financed, right? 
so you've got that. So then what about private savings? Private savings is not very interest sensitive. And in any case, Alan Arbach reminds us that private saving rate depends on the risk-free rate, which we just concluded might decline, even if the risky rate rises. So uh, to just personal saving could actually decline relative to the baseline rather than increase. And remember, investment equals savings. So the, we're, we're, we're stuck now with being bailed out by foreign savings rising to finance an increase in investment. The whole world's in the same boat. Foreign savings is li not likely to increase. Okay, which means you get a crowding out, not a crowding in of investment of non-green, non-subsidized capital. That means potential output in the whole rest of the economy will be weaker because the path of the capital stock will be lower. I'm, these are just assertions and these are issues, I, but that's one, one interpretation. So anyway, on balance of savings is not increased and investment uh, uh, will, will, not, uh, will not rise. Okay, um, next, next question. Are there sufficient reserves and will there be sufficient supplies of critical minerals to achieve the wholesale remaking of our energy economy? As I noted yesterday, we economists agree that quantity supply will be quantity demanded, but at what price? Will political or geopolitical frictions imply absolute limits to the quantities of some of these minerals? And as an example, projections by S&P suggest that global copper demand will nearly double by 2035 in, in a, about a decade, with half of that accounted for by increased uh, energy transition technologies. Pebble mines off the, off the table, right? All right? All right, so what if supplies don't come online sufficiently fast to prevent increases in prices that will indeed short circuit the energy transition? Could happen. In any case, extreme volatility in these prices is probably likely, and that being a new fact of life, that's not helpful to economic growth. So that's another impediment. Will inflation go up or down? Well, the easy answer is inflation goes where the Fed wants it to go. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, but with likely increases in agricultural prices and investment increases straining capacity, and labor force, labor force perhaps reduced as a result of the big uh, inter-industry in, inter transitions, there's likely pressure for inflation to rise. And if the Fed attempts to offset that, it does it, of course, by raising interest rates, and that's not helpful for capital accumulation and potential GDP. Next question, what's a reasonable path for the economy-wide energy intensity parameter, or the inverse, the energy efficiency parameter? To me, this is huge because it tells us how much we have to do to actually accomplish our goals. I mean, it's one, I think it's one of the two big, big things. Okay, but um, you know, the, the lack of adaptation seen in Marshall Burke's work does not make me optimistic, especially given the fact that we're not doing anything to raise the price of energy. So how are we, what's the incentive to conserve on energy? So, um, you know, wishful thinking will not cause that uh, energy efficiency to bend in the direction that we want, uh, which leads me to the next deep uncertainty. Have we put in place the incentives needed to push energy efficiency along the required path? My sense is not even close. And I think some of the results, the simulations we saw, we fall short of the goals. All right. So without a much larger increase in energy prices or as an alternative carbon prices, it's doubtful the improvement in energy efficiency will proceed as needed. And the current emphasis and policy is on U.S. regulatory mandates, demand subsidies, production investment subsidies, and the fourth and the arguably the most important lever is not on the agenda. So how do we further incentivize carbon reduction if we can't use that four-letter word, T-A-X, right? Now, we can encourage, as a substitute, maybe encourage additional regional cap and trade systems as a way to boost carbon prices. I have this inkling, and maybe it's more a hope uh, than, it's certainly not an analysis, but it's something I think worth investigating, is whether European CBAMs, the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, will in fact export higher carbon prices to the United States. Because US goods uh, imported in the European market will be subject to um, a, a tariff of sorts. Okay, and then, 
related, will the magnitude of stranded assets whose value will quickly fall to zero? Oh, this is my next point. Uh, Question: Will the value, will the magnitude of stranded assets whose value will quickly fall to nearly zero, scrappage value basically, will this be a material hit to the household sector net worth, and will that have implications for consumption? We tend to think about fossil fuel-related assets, but it extends to whether a sea level rise will lead us to abandon parts of cities as well. Next. Uh, big question. How will we finance the massive investments needed globally? Even if advanced economies can facilitate a reallocation of investments from fossil to green investments and perhaps increase capital flows uh, to manage this task, how will the global south manage to do the same? Okay, we we took a teaspoon, right? And we gave in in the last cop a, you know, a little bit of a little bit of help. Next big uncertainty. How will labor markets respond if there are frictions? And we know there will be. Similar to what happened after the Great Recession and the pandemic to some extent, industry or industrial ge geographical occupational mismatch arising from the decline in fossil fuel usage will lead to a decline in labor market matching efficiency and presumably a temporary rise in the natural rate of unemployment or the NIRU. And that you know, could, if it occurs slowly, it won't be huge, but it, it likely will happen and that will complicate the Fed's job. Um, and could adversely impact, uh, I mean, it will adversely impact potential GDP as folks are simply dropping out of the labor force or not, you know, effectively not being able to be reemployed. Uh, policies to facilitate the transition uh, for employees in fossil fuel industries, uh, similar to trade readjustment assistance, uh, maybe could be useful, but we have to actually fund it, not just say we're funding it. And then finally, uh, immigration. Um, you know, big big question. Um, it's not clear the extent to which current immigration flows from Central and South America are due to climate, more likely due to just societal breakdown. But you know, will it be a trickle, a flood, a tsunami? We don't know. So that's another big policy issue and uncertainty. And that's it. Thank you, Chris. Um, and so I'm going to have some questions for each of you, and then we're going to open it up um, to the audience. So I guess I'll start with you, Chris, since we just flipped from the so, so you got, came up with a great list of deep uncertainties. What is your guidance to our colleagues at places like OMB and CBO who have to make forecasts in light of these deep uncertainties? How would you suggest they go about thinking about them? How would you suggest they go about communicating uh, about their forecasts in light of these? Deep uncertainties. So I want Wendy to put on a series of seminars for each of these where we have Blanchard and Summers or Stock or some other luminaries of the profession think about these very carefully and give us some guidance. I think I think that's that would be helpful. Additional conferences like this to gather, you know, some of our best minds to address these issues, I think would be would be helpful. All right. Um, so, Emmy, I think you you sort of addressed your comments towards sort of the sort of models that that OMB currently uses. So, I'm going to ask you to go sort of the other end of our audience or use cases for the roundtable. So, in light of your questions, what would you tell our colleagues at NFF? And I think Anjali stepped out, but and at NOAA and others who might fund research to advance the frontier. What would you be, be your priorities for them? I think probably making a uh, connection, um, you know, finding some connection point between, um, you know, all of the um, important things they've learned from their modeling approaches and these simple macroeconomic uh, frameworks um, would be very valuable. And I think that's what this group is trying to do. And part of it is about just speaking in a, in a common language. Um. And James, uh, so you were very much on the NSF NOAA research agenda side. So what is your guidance to our colleagues at OMB uh, and CBO? I think that there is, um, uh, I think there's a, there's a tiered series of improvements that need to be mapped out. And uh, obviously the work that um, OMB and, and CBO have already done to incorporate these uh, simple representations at the front of the models is the first step. But the question for them to ask is when 
they start to build in some of these feedbacks when they endogenize the, the climate um, damages and the, and the climate emissions, which uh, I'll, I'll say one thing about how that might be done. Um, uh, what does that mean for the kind of work that they need, the, the groundwork that they need to be putting together now? Um, and I think in particular, it means uh, having uh, a big framework of all the different pieces that need to be filled in, recognizing that we only have a couple of pieces. Um, and I think that uh, I, I want to respond to Chris's comment that we're going to have, um, or, or was it, um, I mean, who, who said we were going to have a bunch of individual models hyper focused on on different tasks? You know, I, I would have um, believed that before the advent of Chat GPT, um, but but now I think uh, we're in a world where we really can imagine a holistic understanding, and and that's exactly what we need. And so that's why I think OMB and and CBO need to be um, moving toward just like the NSFs and, and, and those of the world. So uh, if you're interested, want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand on, uh, on whether, Zoom. <laughs> That's weird. Um, so um, while we're, oh, Eric. Hi, this is just a reflection on, on the, the panel as a whole and kind of pass a, a question back that I heard asked from the panel. Um, I thought all of that was very uh, interesting, uh, uh, very interesting input. Uh, Emmy started out by asking, what are the variables we can use from the climate models? Um, and since I, I kind of work in that space, I have some thoughts, but I, I, I'm much more interested in hearing from uh, from the panel, how uh, what is available from the climate models? What what should be taken on board? James, I mean, I'm not sure that the climate models are are quite the the right um, place to get this information. We have incredible biophysical impact models. Um, we have uh, you know the the next stage of that is. Um, where biophysical impacts interact with human decision making um, at the back uh, at the micro level. Uh, so I think um, I think that the panels of impacts that are being developed by groups like uh, EASA, um, Easy Met Coach, to understand the the whole range of how climate will impact different sectors of the of the economy is, is, is the right way to go. And, um, and it's really exciting to see uh, those start to come together. Emmy? So I think um, this is no reflection on anybody in the room, but a quote that stuck with me from a long time ago, and I don't know who it's original to is the difference between a a good economist and a great economist is a great economist knows what to leave out of the model. <laughs> so I think that's a challenge that we that we face and we don't want to get to too much complexity. Maybe chat GBT will change that. I don't know. But I think that, you know, so at this at the simplest level, I think this you know, the very sensible steps that CEA has already taken to look at the impact of potential you know, the, the damage function, if you will, and how that can be incorporated into the projected path of T, TFP in a in a BAU versus a policy uh, with a uh, run with a different temperature path. I think that that totally makes sense. So that's the, to me a key entry point for climate influencing the 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 model and the projections. The second would be impact on the capital stock of the increasing severity and frequency of um, severe of climate events, which destroy capital. Clearly that brings in the whole regional component, which is definitely needs to be looked at. Although I do, I do wonder um, whether the CEA wants to be in and OMB want to be in the business of doing regional analysis of climate policy because of the fact of 
of which states it will hit. And it probably is just something you want to leave to somebody else. Um, but uh, having said that, I think, so the impact of the, you know, the, on the physical capital stock, because that, that will influence both the cost of capital and the level of gross investment that is needed for, um, for fir firms in the private sector to, to uh, achieve their desired capital stock. And so to the extent that it spills over into gross investment, that, that has lots of implications. Um, the, and then the other things, there's lots of ways that transition risk and policy changes can, can enter into the model. But yeah, and you know, the other ones that are not really, you know, they're important, um, which would, but, but I think difficult to forecast would be the impact on immigration and, you know, how that would Im influence uh, labor force, working age population and so on. And then ag prices. Um, yeah, that's what I can think of. Yeah. I had one reaction to, I guess, both uh, James and Chris's comments, um, which is that uh, maybe it's useful to translate some of these ideas about simplicity into the language of machine learning. So one of the first things that you learn when you learn about machine learning is about the fundamental importance of regularization. Um, so to avoid overfitting, um, you know, you choose a simple model often, even though you know the model is wrong. And I think, um, you know, the, the challenge that we have is that, um, you know, macroeconomics really is small data in the sense of the number of years we have. So there may be um, many variables in each year, there may be many countries, uh, but, you know, fundamentally, you only see one history. It's not clear we can go back to the pre-industrial revolution period and, you know, use those data to kind of um, think about investment dynamics today. Um, so I think that is kind of a fundamental challenge that, that we face and is actually, you know, fairly well captured in machine learning ideas. It's just that, you know, the macroeconomic data is not the typical use case for those methods. Um, so I think that's one of the, one of the trade-offs that we're, we're, we're thinking about here. Uh, Tim. Oh. Tim. Sorry, you wouldn't let me unmute, Bob. Thank you, panel. Um, thanks, everyone, for a really stimulating workshop. Um, as a climate modeler, um, something that would kind of help me understand where we're at, at least, which I didn't see in the last couple of days, is um, how good or bad are the macroeconomic models in forecast mode? And on which variables are they better and on which are they worse? I mean, in climate, you can go back to the climate models of the 1990s and see that even those were, even back then, we would have been okay at predicting global temperature and we'd probably have done all right on the sea level rise, but we'd have been really poor on, you know, the water cycle or something. And we might have got better on that over time. But I'd love to get a sense from the panel or anybody else, you know, if you go back to the 2013 10 year projection or whatever you called it and um, compare it to what unfolded um what how or oh, go back to 2003 and look at those 10 years up to 2013 i really haven't got a proper sense yet of you know what can be reliably forecast with what skill and what can't because for me that would be really helpful as a scientist to understand well are we going to be able to pick out you know the climate or the transition signal from from the noise or the uncertainty so if, if the panel or anyone uh, can help guide on that, that would be great. Because my, my kind of outsider's hunches are, I've got this vague sense that there are some things that are more deterministic and predictable than others, but I'd love to know a bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that. I think it all depends on um, what you're comparing to. So I think um, there, the CBO, for example, predictions, which tend to be very similar to professional forecasters, um, are much better than um, a lot of crazy things that people say. So um, I think uh, they're very helpful in, in cutting off tails, you know, things that have not been seen in history and so on, which which really is out there in the distribution. Um, if if you um, if you if if you sample, you know, a random uh, group of of of, of of business people or or people who aren't familiar with economic data. On the other hand, if you know you're comparing to a random walk, you know the simplest possible model, sort of the no change forecast, um, then it's you know kind of a tighter race. Um, and the fact of the matter is, 
that, um, you know, there've been many periods of um, autocorrelated forecast errors, you know, I'm sure Chris can painfully remember some of those cases, like for example, in the late 1990s, when growth was extremely high and um, the CBO among other professional forecasters was repeatedly sort of expecting things to go back to normal until finally people started to believe, including the CBO, that actually this was here to stay. And right then there was the dot-com um, <laughs> crash. And, and so, you know, obviously they were burned by that you know, during the Great Recession, you know, no one expected how long it was going to take um, for the recovery. There was this kind of repeated belief that things were going back to normal again, back to normal, back to normal, back to normal, and just, it just didn't happen. Um, no one expected how long the zero lower bound was going to last. You know, we talked about the effect of climate change on longer term interest rates. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that it's pretty hard to, to, to figure out what's happening, what's going to happen to longer term interest rates, even when you don't um, put in the effects of climate change. So I think it's all about what you're um, what you're comparing to. I mean, I think I, I don't want to, you know, I I, I want to be positive in the sense that I think um, that these forecasts do a lot better um, than um, than you would do, um, you know, if you're sort of uh, sort of picking randomly or something along those lines. But this is what I was trying. To, this is what I was trying to say when when I said that I think more complex models. Um, have have often not done better, and so I think we have to sort of be somewhat humble about that fact that um, that sometimes you know simpler models can can do better because of this issue of overfitting and so on. So, oh, Jim, Jim, you want to could, could I just jump in on that one point? I think it's also you know I think it's um, you, you can't really compare across uh, domains. I, I mean, there's a, a tremendous amounts of uncertainty that just evolves. So you think about. Uh, you think about COVID. Okay, so guess what? All of the economists circa 2019 got COVID wrong. Uh, and that had the biggest effect on unemployment we've seen since the depression. I mean, just extraordinary. So there's just like gigantic shocks. It's kind of like, you know, for you guys, like Greenland falls into the sea, you know, and then it jumps back out, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, so, but, but that doesn't say that there's other aspects where you can have more confidence, which are maybe conditional forecasts. So conditional on a certain path, what do you think things would be? And then if you do a Delta, say, we're going to spend a whole lot more. I think there's better evidence that we can, you know, be able to say things about that. So for example, if we think there's going to be low frequency productivity effects of a number of climate variables, then I think one can have a reasonable amount of confidence in those deltas, even that there's a fair amount of uncertainty about what that baseline actually is gonna be. Like chat GBT, who knows what the effect of that's gonna be on productivity 10, 15 years ago. We just, just don't know, but we can still have some confidence in the deltas. So, oh. You know, it, speaking as a climate scientist, like in the IPCC world, we would say that's probably a situation we would dub low confidence and we would not give a best estimate. We would give potentially a range. Uh, the practice in econ is to give a, in particularly in, in sort of practical economics of, of the Troika and CBO is to focus very much on a central scenario, uh, which implies that you know the distribution, you have some sense that there is a distribution centered on that central scenario as opposed to a, a range of options. So how do you think about, you know, that that these alternative forms of uncertainty communication and, you know, is is really focusing on a central scenario and appropriate given what we just talked about, or might there be alternatives approach that would fit better? Yeah, that's that's a great point. So every month we we produce a baseline forecast and an optimistic and a pessimistic that are based upon what we think at that particular time, you know, might be, you know, changes in assumptions. So there's basically three different conditional forecasts. Um, and then we also do a set uh, of an, of an additional five scenarios. So we're, we're, you know, that that's to a smaller set of clients where again, those are driven by particular narratives that reflect risks that we think are important at that particular time. So there's a whole range of this, is, you know, GDP paths look like spaghetti spilled on a plate um, to, to represent the uncertainty. That's one way. And the other way is, you know, we've built, um, we call them probability assessment tools where we, we actually fit a much smaller uh, macro model with about half a dozen variables and it's got some nice features about, um, you know, growth 
growth of GDP is dependent on where you're on the cycle, for example, uh, at the outset. And we do Monte Carlo simulations and create probability surfaces that help to, you know, uh, for select clients, help them gauge the degree of uncertainty around the baseline forecast. So. so would you give any advice to our uh, federal colleagues based on that experience? So I think the range um, does make some sense. And, you know, see, uh, I don't think Bob mentioned it yesterday, but the CBO periodically does uh, produce the fan charts, which mm -hmm. shows the range of uncertainty, um, you know, which nobody knows what those mean. So nobody looks, at them. I mean, <laughs> very few people know what those mean, so they don't look at them, but but those are useful. Wendy. So I, th I think the question is, what do you want policymakers to do with those ranges? So if you just produce a GDP range, I, I don't know that there's much in there that's that's actionable for policymakers. And the point of the GDP, like there, at, and and frankly, I don't think any policymaker is like doing something because GDP is produced by CBO was X, Y, or Z. Instead, it's meant to be a point of comparison to if you change policy, then this is what will happen. And it's meant to be an input into the into the budget projection where like the system completely would grind to a halt if you had a range of budget projections. So that's why you need a point estimate on the economic projections. Now, when it comes to actually actual variables in CBO's forecast that are particularly uncertain, uh, policymakers who are in a position to do something about it are keenly aware of the uncertainty around particular variables and what to do. And there's, there's a huge amount of back and forth. So take something like labor force participation of prime age men where it just kept not going up uh, in the, you know, in the, in the teens. And, you know, for a long time, CBO then got it wrong because they thought it was gonna be higher and blah, blah, blah. Like CBO produced report after report about what was happening to labor force participation among prime age men and policymakers thought about what policies do we want to address that. Think about interest rates where that's one of the ones where CBO just con continuously got it wrong. There is a boatload of analysis that the agency produces of if interest rates are higher or lower, this is what would happen to budget projections. So if you drill down into the variables that are uncertain, this is, I mean, there is laser focus on how policymakers should care about uncertainty in particular variables that I think is quite actionable, whereas a range around GDP, I mean, that's just kind of, you know, that's, I, I don't know what they do with that news. I, I'm, I, I think this is really uh, a challenge for how to um, how microeconomists working in climate understand the problem that that we're facing because the uh, we're dealing with multiple layers and kinds of uncertainty, right? There's there's deep uncertainty in um, the way that these impacts will manifest and what the transition will look like. And um, we want policymakers to help us engage with that. We, we want them to engage with that, that uncertainty because we think it's quite important. And we want to, to figure out how to translate that into policy action. I, I, don't, um, I don't have a way forward, but I, I do think that uh, at, even at the level of, of basic GDP, this is um, this is a manifestation of the deep problems that that, that climate poses. I'll just, I just want to react and say I think I've, I I mean at least personally I've learned a ton over the past two days about how to think about uncertainty around climate and the, if, the then the uncertain effects on the economy and then what that means for risk averse policymakers and maybe separately what that means about making optimal policy that's robust in the face of uncertainty. So no, 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 I, 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 I'm not, I'm not trying to shut this down by any at all. Well, I think we've reached the uh, end of the hour. Um, so thank you to the three of you for bringing us uh, this great summary panel. Um, 
Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not actually going to take much more of your time. So we just had a, a great, sorry, I should stand in front of the mic. I'm not going to take much more of your time. We just, uh, I'll stand where I can be seen by the other night. Okay. I'm not. I'm not going to take much more of your time. This has been a great pleasure to uh, have everybody here. Uh, we've all learned a lot and we've all had a really good time, I think, interacting with each other in person and through the uh, great job of the IT folks here at the Academy, um, really integrating the online audience as well. So thank you for the online audience. Um, and I look forward to the next version of this workshop. So thanks very much. <laughs>